That's God's book. Jesus said when the devil was tempting him, he was hungry and fasting about 40 days, he said, if you're the son of God, command these stones that they be made bread. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. This is our food. This is our food. We need to eat this. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 13, 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. They were a joy to my soul. The only way you can eat this is to do it. Praise the Lord. I don't know how long it's going to take some folks to realize that God wants to take complete control of their lives and he wants them to feed upon the word of God. I want to call your attention tonight to a scripture over in Hebrews, second chapter of Hebrews. Reading from the first verse, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. One translation said, or slip away from them. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with sign and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. We want to talk tonight a little while about this so great salvation. We're going to talk to the Lord first. Our Lord Jesus, we just thank and praise you for your word. Thank you for your presence in our lives. And Lord God, you know exactly what we need tonight. And so we're asking you to set the table. And we're asking you to give us what we need tonight. You know every heart. You know the need of every heart. And so with that, we're asking you tonight to set the table, and we're going to ask you tonight to give us just exactly what we need. Let everything that's said and done, Lord, tonight, redound to thy glory and honor, that thy name might be glorified, and thy name might be exalted, and we might glorify thy name. And we be careful to give you the praise in the name of Jesus. You know, I've often thought about the Garden of Eden. I like to have seen the Garden of Eden. It must have been a wonderful place with all the trees in the garden of every kind of a fruit. It must have been a beautiful place. It was called paradise. So it must be a beautiful place. I'm thinking about how that Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden, God supplied everything for them. Of course, they had all the fruit they wanted, all the vegetables they wanted. They were fruitarians and vegetarians. They they didn't eat no meat. But best of all, when the cool of the day come and the Lord God came into the garden, in the cool of the day. 
I could just see Adam taking the hold of the hand of Eve and saying, Eve, God's in the garden. Come on. And they come to meet the Lord and they have wonderful fellowship and communion with the Lord. All they knew was the Lord. They didn't know anything else. All they knew was God. They were absolutely dependent upon God for everything. And all they knew was God. My, what a wonderful place. What a wonderful time. What a blissful time to be with God continually. And after all, that's why God created man. Isaiah 43 and 7 says that God created man for his own glory. Or in other words, he created man for himself. I don't know how long that blissful time lasted, but one day something came about that brought about a change. Eve perhaps was standing close to that tree of the knowledge of the good and the evil, wondering why God gave them the privilege of partaking of all the fruit of the trees in the garden, but that one tree, you know, the devil sometimes watches and sees concerning certain conditions that might exist in our life. He takes advantage of it. And he came, he was incorporated in, in, in uh, I don't mean incorporated, I mean incarcerated in the serpent. And he came and with a subtle, a subtle uh, a question. It seemed to be on the surface. It seemed to be just an ordinary question. Yay! As God said that you should not eat of every tree in the garden. Now, where Eve made her first mistake was she should have called her husband. Second mistake was she misquoted the scripture that God had given to Adam. Now, you can't find in the scripture where God ever said anything to Eve about not partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He never said nothing to Eve about that. So she must have gotten her information from Adam. But she said, we may eat of all the trees in the garden, but there's one tree that God had said, you should not eat it, neither touch it, lest ye died. God didn't say that at all. God said to Adam, in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. But Eve said, Lest you die, maybe you will, and maybe you won't. She compromised with the word of God. And when the devil saw that she had compromised with the word of God, he blatantly said, you won't die, he called God a liar. You won't die. God knows that the day that you eat of that fruit, you'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. And it said when Eve saw, first of all, lust of the eye. That the tree was good, the fruit of the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh. And a thing to be desired to make one wise, pride of life, she took of it and gave to Adam, and he did eat. And their eyes were open. Oh, yes. They had the knowledge now of good and evil, but they could not do the good, and the only thing they would do would be to do the evil. Not only that, they saw they were naked. So they made some fig leaves, took some fig leaves, put them together, tried to sew them together. 
to cover up their nakedness. People try to cover up their nakedness, try to cover up their sin in many, many different kind of ways. But there's only one way that the sin can be covered, and that is through the shedding of blood. And therefore, God took a couple animals, and he slew them, and he took the shedding of the blood, he shed the blood, and he made coats for them. He covered them with the skin of the animals, coats made out of the skin of the animals. And they later on, because he did not want them to partake of the tree of life, he drove them out of the garden, put the cherubims there that they could not possibly enter into the garden anymore and drink of, and eat of the tree of life tree of life and be in a condition like they were in. And so they hid themselves behind the trees in the garden when they heard the Lord coming into the garden. And the Lord said, Adam, where are you? Now God knew where Adam was. He knew where he was positionally. He also knew where he was conditionally. He knows what he'd done, no doubt about it. Adam, and what did Adam do? Adam didn't seek God. Why didn't he come and ask forgiveness? Why didn't he seek God? No, there's no one on earth that ever sought God in their own volition. Why, Brother Jones, I sought God. Yeah, when did you seek him? When you heard the truth of the word of God? When you became convicted, you didn't seek God in your own volition. You didn't say, I want, oh, they might seek religion. But seeking God is another thing altogether. And if you don't believe what I say, you read the 10th chapter of the, I mean the third chapter of Romans in the 10th verse, he'll tell you plainly that there's none that seeketh after God, I didn't say it, God said it. Amen. Should have been seeking God, but instead of that, he passed a buck and he prayed on, on the woman. He said, that woman you give me, he hadn't given her, me, her. I'd been all right. But that woman you give me, she's the one that gave me the, uh, the, the um, fruit, and I did eat. And so they were drilled out of the garden. But then God said to the woman, what have you done? Well, she blamed the right one. She said the serpent beguiled me. She found out she had been deceived, but it was too late. The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. She blamed it on the serpent and she was right. And the Lord said, you'll have sorrow all the days of your life, you'll bring forth children and your desire will be to your husband. When he said that, then he said, he didn't, he didn't, ask, he didn't ask the serpent any question. But he said, I'll put the, but amnity, I'll put amnity between thee and the woman and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And do you know the devil through the history of mankind did everything he possibly could to frustrate that indictment that God had given. That was not only an indictment, it was also a promise. Glory to God that humanity was going to be redeemed one of the days it was a promise, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. The woman does not have the seed. The men have the seed. There's no woman that ever had the seed, naturally. So in order for that scripture to be fulfilled, it would be necessary for God to perform a miracle. And while the devil was doing everything he possibly could, for instance, in the days of Esther, he incited Haman, filled him so with such hatred against Mordecai because Mordecai would not bow down to him 
And he decided he was going to kill all the Jews, men, women, children, all of them. The devil was going to get rid of all of them. If he'd done so, we'd never had a savior. But thank God the Lord overturned everything. He had a woman in there by the name of Esther, which means a star. And she was a star in the darkest days of the history of Israel. She was a star. She delivered them. Haman himself was hanged on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai, and the Jews were delivered. But while, him, while the devil was doing his worst, endeavoring to frustrate that indictment that the Lord had indicted against him, the Lord was preparing the seed to bruise his head. And therefore we find that God chose a man by the name of Abraham. Abram chose him out of the air, the Chaldees. Chose him out of idolatry. Scripture says over there in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, by faith Abraham was called of God to go out into the place where he should afterward give him for inheritance. He went out not knowing where he went. Or to find out in the history that he took his father with him and he took his nephew with him. He took his wife, Sally, I, with him also. And they did, they did not go to Canaan. They dwelt in the land of, Tel of, 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 of Helen. And they were there for about 10 years. And then father, his father, Tela, died and him and his, son and his nephew went into the land of, of Canaan. Now they're in, he's in the land that God wanted him to be in in the first place. God gave him seven different promises, told him he would bless him and he would be a blessing. You know, it's a wonderful thing to get the blessing from God, but God blesses you in order that you might bless someone else. Amen. Amen. God does not give blessings that are not useful. God does not give blessings uh, that are not to be used. He blesses you. I want to be blessed. And I realize I can't be a blessing unless I am blessed. Unless I receive the blessing from God, I can't be blessed. But God blessed Abraham, gave him seven promises, and said, I, and, and, and said in thee, all the entire world are going to be blessed. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed in thy seed. He promised him a seed. And so what, what, did, the, what did the Lord say about uh, in his indictment? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now he has chosen Abraham, and he says that his seed will be a blessing to all the world. In thy seed shall all the world, nations of the world be blessed. And then we find... Abraham was a very rich man, had very much cattle, and so, so did his nephew Lot. And so we find that they had, could not, they did not have the strife between the herdsmen of Abraham and Lot, and they could not find enough pasture for the cattle. And therefore Abraham said to Lot, you take the first choice, and wherever you go, I'll take what's left. Lot looked over at the plain of Jordan. He saw the luscious grass there, and he chose for present advantage. I wonder if someone had to come up and say, Lot, if you make the choice that you're deciding on making, oh, how we should oh, seek the mind of the Lord how we should seek the will of the Lord, 
how we should seek to be in the will of the Lord. Not our own will, but the will of the Lord. He said, you make the choice you're going to make, you're going to find out that you're going to go in that wicked city of Sodom. Your two daughters are going to marry the Sodomites. Your other daughters and your wife and you are going to escape, but you're going to lose everything you've accumulated. All the money that you receive from selling all your cattle, going into the city of Sodom, you're going to lose it all. Your wife's going to turn to a pillar of salt. Your two daughters are going to commit incest in a cave. I don't think that Lot would have made that choice. But Abraham left the choice to God. And when we leave the choice to God, we always get the best. After Lot had left Abraham, the Lord said to Abraham, Abram, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. All the land that you see, I'm going to give to you and your seed. And then he went, then he said, I'm going to make your seed as the sand of the sea. I'm going to give you an earthly seed. Abraham didn't have no seed. You know how, all about how when Isaac was born and they called his name Isaac, which meant laughter. And then uh, I, I've got to be, I, 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 I want to cover some ground today, but I, I'm going to have to come up maybe a little fast because I got too much, a whole lot to say. And then we find that Abraham was promised a earthly seed. And then on the 15th chapter of Genesis, Nighttime, God said, Abraham, you look, look up into the heavens. Look at the stars. And there you see the stars. Your seed is going to be as the stars of heaven. In other words, he was promised an earthly seed. He was promised a heavenly seed. That earthly seed happened to be, if, after his promise then, of course, and that earthly seed happened to be at that particular time, Isaac. And I said that Isaac meant laughter. Then, of course, Isaac had a wife by the name, by the name of, 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 of Rebecca. And Eliezer had gone over into the country uh, where uh, for to, to, to get a wife for Isaac. And he brought her. Uh, her, her back and her name was Rebecca and then the Lord said to Rebecca and she had twins in her womb and he said the elder shall serve the younger and then in the ninth chapter of the book of Romans we find that that is repeated he told he told Rebecca that but also it's repeated by the Apostle Paul in the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. And he said uh, that the elder shall serve the younger. And then he said, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. I heard where somebody said one time to Dwight L. Moody, I think it was, why did God hate Esau? He said, the thing that bothers me is how in the world could God ever love Jacob? Esau, we're told, was a profane man. He carried no, cared nothing about the things of God. You know how I, uh, that uh, Jacob stole uh, it's the birthright, uh, made Esau sell the birthright to him, and then how he also stole the blessing and so forth and so on. But through Jacob came the 12 tribes of Israel. God is developing the seed, that's what I'm talking about. God is developing the seed. So he chose one man. Then he chose one nation. And that nation was Israel. And then finally the time came when he chose one tribe. And that tribe was Judah. And in the 49th chapter of the book 
of Genesis, we find that when Jacob was blessing the 12 tribes, oh my land, the 12 tribes of Israel, it says that scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a law given between his feet until Shiloh come. He prophesied of the fact that there was going to be a man by the name of Shiloh, which means peace. That was referring to our Lord. We find over there in Isaiah 9 and 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the, 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 the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There is no priest in this world. The world is looking for peace. There is no peace outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, they'll have a little false peace. But when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction well, it will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And so then, if we read of the 12 tribes of Israel, God chose Israel, and then one day David had, he wanted to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord said, he's going to make, I, I'll make of you a house. And it also said in the 132nd Psalm, and about the 11th verse, he said, I will sit upon thy the fruit of the Lord is sworn unto David. He will not turn from it. I will sit upon the thro thy throne out from the midst of thy body. I will sit upon thy throne. In other words, from those who have come become your seed, I, God, God, God himself said that he was going to sit upon the throne of David. God said he was going to do that. How's he going to do that? Well, we find out that he's going to do it one of these days. Praise the Lord. And so we find that God chose a man, God chose a nation, and then God chose a tribe, the tribe of Judah. And so we find in the, in the first chapter of Romans, I'm going to turn to it here in a moment. First chapter of Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, be called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, who was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, according rather to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus was of the seed of David. So the seed then that God was talking about in that indictment, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now we find that this seed is a promised seed. This seed is an earthly seed. This seed is a heavenly seed. This seed is a royal seed. And they all culminate in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the third chapter of Galatians for a moment. I used to, in turning the Bible, go fast, but I do that. I found out I tore it all to pieces, and I don't do that anymore. Third chapter of Galatians, 16th verse. Now to Abraham, wait, let's look at the 14th verse, or rather the 13th verse. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed, is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
16th verse. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. In Christ is the full culmination of the earthly seed, the heavenly seed, and also the royal seed, because he was of the seed of David. Now, Matthew was the one who wrote the gospel to the Jew. Matthew wrote to the Jew. Mark Luke to, wrote to the Romans. Luke wrote all about the manhood of Jesus. For four, uh, 24 times, the words that are used are the Son of Man. And John was the one that exalted the Lord Jesus as the mighty God. But here we find now the seed is a royal, is a, of an earthly seed, a heavenly seed, and a royal seed. Jesus was both God and man. He was of the seed of David. He was born of a woman. He's not only the seed of David, he's also the seed of the woman. And he was the one that fulfilled that promise that God gave, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so we find there was a man in the hill country by the name of Zacharias. And he was a priest. And his office was that he offered up incense. And so he went into the temple to offer up incense. And there by the side of the temple was an angel. And the angel said, Fear not, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. No, evidently he and Elizabeth had prayed for a son. Said, Your wife shall conceive. Bear a son, he shall be great, he shall go before the Lord, he shall prepare the Lord, make a way before the Lord, he shall be great. And of course that uh, time came and the, the angel said, uh, uh, Zechariah said, how, how can this be? I'm an old man, my wife's stricken in years. The angel said, because you did not believe, do not believe what I'm telling you, you will be dumb. And he could not speak one word after that. He went out and finally Elizabeth conceived and of course the child was born and the time came for the eighth day for the child to be circumcised. The friends and the relatives were all there. And they said, we're going to call his name Zacharias. The mother said, not so. His name is John. Well, they said, you've not got any kindred by that name. And then they went, asked the father. He asked for a writing table, and he wrote, his name is John. As he wrote, his name is John, his tongue was loosed. He began to praise God. He prophesied a wonderful prophecy. I can't go into detail. A little later on, oh my, a little later on, an angel came to the town of Nazareth, came to a virgin by the name of Mary. Hail, thou art hail, highly favored among women. And Mary, oh, from now on all nations shall call thee blessed. And Mary wondered at that salutation and you know, the angel always said, fear not. That's what Jesus always said. Fear not. When they were out in the boat there and in the storm and Jesus was walking there upon the water and they thought they saw it, seen a spirit. He said, fear not, it is I, it's I. Be not afraid. Jesus always brought peace. Jesus always said, fear not. Jesus always brought peace. And after his resurrection, even, we're going to look further, 
a little bit too far here, but after his resurrection, the very first thing he said, when they were there in the, uh, in the room, because of the fear of the Jews, he appeared before them, he said, peace be unto you. But now we find that Jesus is the seed of the woman. He is also the seed, uh, a natural seed, uh, a natural seed uh, and a heavenly seed, and he is of the seed of David. Now, Matthew wanted to prove that he was the seed of David, and so in in the genealogy there in the first chapter, we find that David is mentioned first, even before Abraham. David is mentioned. And then we find, by the way, We find two women also in that genealogy, two Gentile women in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, Rahab the harlot and Ruth the Moabitess. Rahab came into Israel. Her life was spared. All of her friends and all of her her relatives, they were also in the house with her. Their life was spared also, and so she became an Israelite, and she married a man by the name of Salmon. And Salmon and Rahab had a son by the name of Boaz. And Boaz married Ruth, the Moabitess. And then they had a son by the name of Obed, and then there was a son by the name of Jesse, and then David. And there is where we have the royal line. Now, God said, of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. And so Jesus then is the seed of David. And Matthew is proving that. And therefore, he uses, first of all, he uses David. Then he comes down through Abraham and finally ends up with Joseph. But wait a minute. That's a legal genealogy. Joseph was not the husband of Mary. That's only a legal genealogy. That doesn't prove that Jesus was of the seed of David. And so therefore we find another genealogy. And that's over in Luke. And that's the third chapter of Luke. It starts out with Joseph and ends up with Adam. What we find in that genealogy that Joseph of Heli. But over in Matthew, it said that Joseph was the son of Jacob. Now, Joseph didn't have two sons. I mean, two fathers. Matthew said that Joseph was the son of Jacob. Luke said that Joseph was the son of Heli. Now, in the Hebrew, they used the word son interchangeably either meaning son or son-in-law. He was the son of Jacob, but he was the son-in-law of Heli because he had married Mary, and Mary also was the seed of David. Consequently, he therefore was of the seed of David. But after the devil had exhausted everything, trying to frustrate the purpose of God, finally he began to realize who was the real seed that was prophesied of when God said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed, thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. And he realized that Jesus Christ was of the seed in it. We find that through the history of the Lord, during his ministry of about three years, a little over, that they tried to kill him more than one time. One time he went into his own hometown, Nazareth, and the one who had charge of the service gave him the book to read. Turn it over, read it there in the 61st chapter of Isaiah. Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and I did be, preach good tidings to the meek, 
bring liberate the captives, open the eyes of the blind, and so forth and so on. And he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And then he said, there were many widows in the days of Elijah in Israel, but to none of them were Elijah sent, but to a widow of Sarepta, a Gentile, a Gentile. And then he said there were many lepers in the days of Elisha in Israel, but none of them were healed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And when he said that, all of a sudden these Jews, his neighbors that had been with him during out, no doubt his lifetime, knew all about him, said, what's, and when, this is the, first of all, they said this is the son of Joseph, and so forth and so on. They disregarded him entirely. When he said that, they got so angry, they got so mad, that they took a hold of him, they was going to throw him over the brow of the hill. But he walked right past them. I can see them there. Where is he? Hold him. Why didn't you hold him? Why did you let him go for it? Why what made them so angry when he simply told about what happened in the days of that? Elijah and Elisha. They hated the Gentiles. Did you know that in the days of Jesus, the Jews hated the Gentiles? We find in the 22nd chapter of the book of Acts, when the apostle Paul was making his defense there, after he was up there, uh, and been taken into the castle, and on the porch of the castle, and was making his defense there, and he told how that the Lord had called him and so forth and all, gave his testimony of his experience. And then he said he was in the city of Jerusalem. And he said, the Lord said to him, go out of this city, for they'll not receive you. They're not going to receive you. He said, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you far hence unto the Gentiles. And when he word this, said that word Gentile, they said, Away with such a man from the earth. The Jews hindered the Gentiles, but thank God, through the cross of Jesus Christ, we're told in the second chapter of the book of Ephesians that the middle wall of petition has been broken down, and the Jew and the Gentile are all one in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. But finally, through a mock trial, he was placed on the cross of Calvary. And there on the cross of Calvary, the seed of the woman was to bruise the serpent's head. The seed of the woman was to defeat the devil. The seed of the woman is to put him out of business. And so we read there that not only Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and shed his blood for the remission of sins in order that all the sins that we had committed since we had come into this world would be atoned for. All of our sins would be wiped away. All of our sins would be wiped away through the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Oh, thank God for the blood. Six to the ninth hour, there's darkness all over the land. And about the six, between the sixth and ninth hour, darkness all over the land, that fourth cry came out from the lips of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Remember, the indictment was, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. And when you bruise the head of a snake, he's done for. In other words, you're going to be defeated. You're going to be put, put completely put out of business. You're not going to be able to deceive 
those who accept the truth of the gospel. You're not even going to be able to do anything with them whatsoever because they're going to be free, not only from the sins that they have committed, but also the sin, which means that old nature that's in there because of Adam's transgression. Oh, I had too much to say. I had to cut it down. I had just too much to say tonight. My time's all about all gone right now. But he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Fulfilling the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin was made sin, not for us, I mean not for himself, but for us, get that, not for himself, no, 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 but for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was made what we were in order that we might be made what he is. Oh, when I think of the love of God, when I think of all that the Lord has done for me, oh, I'm so filled with the love for him. When I talk about the cross, I can hardly talk about it when I think of all that the Lord has done for me. Not only delivering me from the sins that I committed, but also delivering me from the cause of those sins that I committed, from the very nature that I inherited from Adam. Delivered me from it, thank God, because we find out in Romans 6, 6, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that's dead is freed from sin. And so we find then that the way of victory over all the powers of darkness is found in Romans 6 and 11. Therefore, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. And alive unto God means to give yourself entirely to God. I'm going to close tonight. I'd like to, uh, I guess I could say a lot more, but I'm going to close tonight. When will we ever understand that the only way of the victorious life is absolutely surrender of our entire life unto God? Hallelujah to God. We're going to have to be nothing in order that the Lord Jesus Christ will be everything in our lives. Oh, Jesus is coming soon. These are the days of preparation. And the Lord has made full provision for our complete deliverance from all the powers of darkness. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I'm not quite through yet. I'm going to talk just a little bit more. I want to turn you, I want you to turn rather, for just a few moments to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. I'm calling your attention here to the fourth verse. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a many, many people that don't know what grace is. Of course, theologians say it's the unmerited favor of God. Well, that's true, but that don't tell you anything. Grace is God all In fact, the attributes of God are summed up in his grace. Grace means that God is lavishly giving to those who have been redeemed all that they need for body, soul, and spirit. Grace is given himself, actually, 
In Titus 2.11 it says that the grace of God hath appeared unto all men. The grace of God appeared, that would mean that they'd seen it. What did they see? They saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself is the grace of God. And he has come into our life to take complete control of our life and to work in our life by the power of his spirit and make us what he intends us to be, which is his and his alone to glorify him. Oh, hallelujah. The apostle Paul says over there in Philippians, second chapter, about the 20th verse, that Jesus Christ might be magnified, made big in his life. And then he said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul, what are you saying? You telling me that when you're living, that's Christ living? That's exactly what he meant, and nothing short of it. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Oh, you don't live, no. Yet not I. Oh, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When God's people realize the purpose of why they have been filled with the Holy Ghost, realize God's ultimate purpose, that he wants us for himself, and he wants to take complete control of our lives. And there is no victory. There is no overcoming life. I've said this over and over again. But remember this, that the essence of teaching is repetition. A person has to have things ten, said to him about ten, di ten times in order to retain them. That's what I've been told. I've been said this. Over and over again, that the only way you can be an overcomer is to let God take complete control of your life. Hallelujah. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Are we going to let him do it? The victory has been won. The devil has been conquered. We've been set free from sin. We've been set free from self. Oh, that old self that robs us of the blessings that God wants to bestow upon our life because we're determined to keep that old self in operation and not to surrender ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we going to do it? If we do, I'm talking about something. Perhaps I might be speaking as a fool. When the Apostle Paul began to brag, boast, in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, he said he spoke as a fool. He was forced to do it because of the condition of the Corinthian church. So I'm not talking about theory. I'm talking about something that I actually know, that you can be delivered when you obey the what's the gospel that I talk to you about right now, you can be delivered from all the powers of darkness. You can be absolutely set free from sin, I can, every of every kind, that old nature, any everything. You'll have no desire for the things of the world. You'll have no desire for the things of the flesh. You'll be like Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden before the fall, when they had such sweet communion with the Lord Jesus Christ, God was everything in their life. They knew nothing outside of God, and they gave their entire life to God. They were absolutely dependent upon God in the Garden, in Paradise, through the cross, Thank God paradise has been restored. And what the Lord has 
for his people in the coming paradise so far surpasses that that was called paradise in the Garden of Eden, that there is absolutely no comparison. Second First Corinthians second chapter ninth verse. But I had not seen, neither had it in the heart of man, the things that God had prepared for them that love him, but he's revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. May the Lord bless you.